Hi guys, today we're going to talk about different ways to look at habitats. First we're going to talk about biodiversity, then we'll talk about um, different strategies that species have. I have three examples of very biodiverse habitats here. Coral reefs, which we first learned about in climate change. Prairies, which are grasslands that, create, uh, that contain a lot of flowering species and some trees. You find these a lot in the Midwest um, and we have pockets of them here in Oregon. And then rainforests, including um, you know, tropical rainforests or coastal rainforests like we have here. One of the ways you can describe a habitat is by how biodiverse it is. And a lot of times this is used almost synonymously with healthy. So biodiversity is both um, the total variety of species in a habitat and also the abundance or the amount of all of those different species. So if you look at habitat A, and you look at habitat B, well, um, you know, some of the species may be more abundant over here, and this may have more even abundance. Um, you can talk both in terms of the total different number of species or variety, and then abundance within those species. It's also important to consider each individual population or members of the same species in a particular habitat. Um, we can look at the density um, of a habitat or how crowded it is. Um, and that can be the, you know, simply the number of animals um, per um, specific area of land or number of uh, producers per specific area of land. We can also look at dispersion, how a population is spread out in its habitat. There are three, um, you know, commonly accepted patterns of dispersion. Some are more common than others. First one we can talk about is nearly uniform. These are uh, individuals within a population that are spread out evenly. Um, we can also talk about random. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. Some are clumps, some are spread out, some have, you know, some areas have no individuals from that specific population. And then we can talk about clumped, where individuals within a population group together um, in, in very specific ways in the habitat. Why don't you record this in your notes um, and we're going to play a little game in a second. So um, record for uniform and random kind of what the general pattern was. Draw it in with little dots um, like I have here. And then in the second box you can either write a description or you can write some examples or you can write both. So in this first example I want you to figure out which of the three patterns of dispersion these populations are showing. We have a population of wolves, a population of um, grazers. Um, I think there's both buffalo and sheep in this example. And then a population of fish. So record where you think that example goes. Here we have um, a general grassland where you've got lots of different species in different areas. Record in your notes where you think this, um, you know, uh, where this group of trees and flowers and grasses goes. And then lastly, we have kind of the famous pictures of um, the penguins, where they take up, you know, you can pan out like in the March of the Penguins and just see thousands of these guys. And so on your notes, you should have the penguins being uniform. And this often results because, oops, this often results um, because each individual within the species or within the population of species needs to be separated evenly for, you know, territory, uh, maybe mating. Um, there can be other, you know, space requirements, limiting factors like, um, you know, need for water. Um, you know, some trees and some grasslands have this random pattern because um, they're not really influenced by species next to them very much. Um, and then clumped, you know, sorry, this random one is not very common. There's usually a reason you find most species where you find them in a habitat. Um, and then clumped, this dispersion pattern, is often because these guys survive better together. They can hunt more successfully or they can escape prey more successfully. Um, or 
that they're clumped around the resources, resources like food and water and shelter they're using to survive and reproduce. So better resources here means more individuals in a population using this area. So in addition to, um, you know, uh, dispersion, different species have different evolutionary strategies. And the first one we're going to talk about are our strategists. They tend to be small. They tend to reproduce often and make a lot of babies. And they tend to have short lifespans. And because they have a lot of offspring and they don't live very long, they tend to not care often for the offspring that they have. And so I think of um, things like mice, which can breed multiple times in one season, and things like tadpoles, where you know you lay hundreds of eggs and only you know a small percentage of those are going to be old enough or survive long enough to reproduce. These are oftentimes considered kind of weedy species. They survive for a short period of time fairly, you know, successfully because so many of them exist. Then you have K strategists. These guys tend to be large. They reproduce less often and fewer times over the course of their life. And they have longer lifespans. Because of this, they tend to care more for their offspring. It takes longer um, for them to be pregnant before they have offspring and they care um, for those that they have. Every habitat or ecosystem is going to have a limit to how many species it can support. The things that determine how many species a habitat can support we call limiting factors. Okay, Limiting factors can be sun or heat limit what species or how many species can live in an area. Limiting factors can be things like sun. In a nice, cool, you know, shady forest like those that we have here in Oregon, sun is not going to be very common. And so after a tree falls and you have a pocket of you know, um, sunlight open up, you might have a certain number of species that can grow in that area before they reach um, their carrying capacity or limit in the ecosystem. Another um, limiting factor is harder to see, but it's the nutrients or type of soil. You know, wetlands have a type of soil that stays wet throughout most of the year. Some soils being sandy and well-drained will support other species. So all of these limiting factors create a carrying capacity or kind of a total number of different species that an ecosystem can support. Here you see the total size of the population over time. It can grow for a very long time, often called exponentially. Okay can grow exponentially as it's using all the resources and they're not limited. And then eventually, all the sunlight or all the water availability or all the good soil is going to be used and the population kind of hovers right around this environmental limit. You know, some good seasons it'll be higher, um, you know, seasons that are more harsh, it'll, the population size will be lower. So we talk about this kind of invisible limit in the ecosystem as the carrying capacity. Okay. So there's lots of different ways that you can describe um, populations, um, whether they're biodiverse or not biodiverse, whether they have a lot of R species or K species. And I want you to think about these ways um, as we head outside, these different ways that you can talk about a habitat and you can describe if it's healthy or if it's in transition or if it's been recently disturbed.